Normal maps are useless inside black holes. At the event horizon, the ultimate point of no return as you approach a black hole, time and space themselves change their character. We need new coordinate systems to trace paths into the black hole interior. But the maps we draw using those coordinates reveal something unexpected. They don't simply end inside the black hole, but continue beyond. In these maps, black holes become wormholes and new universes lie on the other side. Cartographers grid up the surface of the Earth in lines of longitude and latitude so that every point on the planet can be clearly defined with two numbers. Well, everywhere but the North and South Poles, that is. There, all lines of longitude merge and all directions become south. We call these points coordinate singularities. A singularity is where a variable in the equation becomes infinite and a single swivel at a pole carries you through the longitudes at an infinite rate. The coordinate singularity of the poles can be banished by shifting the spherical coordinate system used to grid up the Earth, or by changing the coordinate system entirely. For example, you can expand the distance between the lines of longitude as you approach the pole, so those lines don't converge at all. Unroll the resulting cylinder and you have the Mercator projection a perfectly useful map for plotting your path, as long as you remember that Greenland isn't really larger than South America. To map the universe, we need three dimensions of space instead of two, plus the dimension of time. And maps of the universe in this four-dimensional space-time also have coordinate singularities. For example, around the black hole. Our first map of the space-time of a black hole was the Schwarzschild metric, a relatively simple bit of math derived by Carl Schwarzschild just a couple of months after Einstein published his general theory of relativity. It allows us to calculate the path of an object moving in the insane gravitational field approaching a black hole. It even works inside the black hole beneath the inescapable event horizon. But although it works in both of these regions, the Schwarzschild metric cannot be used to plot a trajectory that actually crosses the event horizon. That's because at the event horizon, time appears to freeze from the point of view of the distant observer. And the Schwarzschild metric is defined in terms of that observer's units of space and time. So if they try to trace a path across the horizon in terms of their own clock, the moment of crossing never happens. It's like Achilles chasing the tortoise in Zeno's Paradox. Achilles covers half the remaining distance at each step, and so never closes the gap. Of course, Achilles would actually catch the tortoise, and a plummeting cartographer would fall through the event horizon. The event horizon is just a coordinate singularity like the Earth's poles. And to make a smooth map, we need a Mercator projection of a black hole. In the Mercator projection, the separation of lines of longitude are multiplied by a factor that depends on their latitude, and that multiplication factor becomes infinite at the poles to cancel out the converging lines of longitude. For black holes, we instead fuse time with something called a tortoise coordinate. After Zeno's paradox, it's a measure of distance that becomes infinitesimally compact approaching the horizon. That compactification cancels out the infinite stretching of time so that grid lines can pass smoothly across the event horizon. The first such scheme was Eddington Finkelstein coordinates, and these revealed that the singularity of the event horizon is an illusion. Kruskal Zakeres coordinates improved our map by enforcing that the trajectory of light always be at a 45 degree angle. In the resulting kruskal zakeres diagram, the event horizon is also a 45 degree line, even though it actually has a constant physical size. Because nothing can travel faster than light, this makes it very clear what parts of the universe are accessible. Close to the event horizon, even a light speed path has only a narrow window of escape. And once inside the event horizon, no such window remains. These days, Penrose coordinates are even more popular for travelers of the multiverse. On Penrose diagrams, space and time also bunch up at infinite distance from the black hole, so that the entire universe fits into one diagram. Well, the whole universe? Not quite. In the Mercator projection, we know that lines of longitude and latitude don't just end at the edge of the page, they loop. 
General relativity uses null geodesics, the paths taken by light rays to grid up spacetime. And we also assume that those lines don't just end. There's no abrupt edge to spacetime flapping in the wind. The only place geodesics end is at true singularities, like at the center of the black hole. On our Penrose diagram, we see that light rays can travel either away from the black hole to infinite distance, or they can travel towards the center of the black hole and be lost. And that's all fine. We also see that light rays can come in from far away towards the black hole. No problem there either. But what about light rays going in the other direction? We don't have a sensible point of origin for those rays. We say this Penrose diagram is geodesically incomplete because there are light rays with undefined origins. It's equivalent to saying that we have not yet explored the full range of the Penrose coordinates within the Schwarzschild description of the black hole. If we trace those coordinates to their full extent, we get what we call a maximally extended Schwarzschild solution, and it reveals strange new regions on the Penrose diagram. If we trace a light ray backwards from our universe in this direction, we encounter a region that looks just like the black hole, but with time reversed. This is the white hole, and we've covered this before, but perhaps we'll gain a little more insight into them. Today, we're mostly going to explore an even stranger region, this corner, the region defined by tracing right-moving light rays backwards from within the black hole. In our Penrose coordinates, this region looks like our universe. In fact, it looks like a mirror-reflected version of our universe, at least in terms of the coordinates of space and time. Questions abound. Mainly, is this parallel universe real and can we get there? Well, before I go on, I should say, the map I just drew is for the case of an eternal, non-rotating, or Schwarzschild, black hole. A black hole whose coordinates do not change over time, implying that it always existed. We'll see later how things change in the case of a real black hole born of the collapse of a star. For now, let's see if we can travel to the parallel universe of the eternal black hole. The only way to pass between these universes is to travel faster than light. You can see that by the fact that only paths shallower than 45 degrees can pass between the universes. But imagine you could travel at infinite speed then you could take these horizontal paths, which would dip into the event horizons and emerge in the mirror universe. You've just traveled an Einstein-Rosen bridge, a wormhole. We'll come back to the detailed physics of wormholes another time. Today, we're interested in what that journey can tell us about the parallel universe on the other side. Let's say you drop into a black hole to try to get to the other side. Within the black hole, space and time have switched roles. These lines represent steps towards the central singularity. It's the old radial direction, but now it flows only in one direction to your crushing demise. These lines are the old time dimension, but now traversable in both directions. Once inside the black hole, what do you see? Light can reach you from the universe behind. Those are photons that overtake you heading towards the central singularity. Light can also reach you from below. That's light from anything that fell in before you. It's trying to escape and will ultimately fail, dragged down by the cascading fabric of space. But for now, you overtake that light and get a glimpse of the black hole's past. You never actually see the singularity. That is manifest as an inevitable crushing future in which the space around you becomes infinitely curved. So what do you do? You can turn around and try to go back the way you came. And if you can travel faster than light, you'll emerge from the same event horizon that swallowed you. Or you can plunge faster than light towards the light coming from below. That means going this way. Against intuition, traveling faster than light in that direction doesn't get you to the singularity more quickly. Instead, you're ejected through the parallel horizon into the parallel universe. Within the black hole, you see an event horizon both behind you and ahead of you, but only superluminal speeds will get you to either. Assuming you could reach the parallel universe, what would you see then? Well, this is where opinion is divided. Some think the parallel universe and the white hole are just coordinate reflections of the regular universe and the black hole, that they don't have an independent existence. 
Just as with the Mercator projection, traveling off the edge of the Schwarzschild spacetime brings you back somewhere into the same spacetime. Exactly where depends on how that reflection works. Perhaps you emerge from the past white hole, traveling forwards in time, or from the future black hole, but traveling backwards in time, which would just look like falling into the black hole to someone who themselves is moving forward in time, which is very confusing. It's okay that this doesn't make much sense. Faster than light travel always leads to silly paradoxes because it's impossible. Not only is faster than light travel impossible, but eternal black holes don't exist either. The parallel universe and the white hole are needed in the map of the eternal Schwarzschild black hole in order for geodesics to have somewhere to have come from. But real black holes form from collapsing stars. There's no white hole in their past. And within those black holes, any outgoing light rays can be traced back to the surface of the collapsing star and to its interior. Even though the parallel universe of the Schwarzschild black hole isn't likely to be real, there are intriguing possibilities that Einstein-Rosen bridge can potentially be made to lead to different parts of this universe and could be traversed if it could be pried open. Well, that's a huge if, but it would allow instant travel between distant locations. And in the case of rotating black holes, the traversable wormhole and even the parallel universe are not so easy to dismiss as in the Schwarzschild black hole. In fact, will soon follow a sub light speed path through a Kerr black hole into parallel regions of space-time. Hey everyone, welcome to the new space-time studio, AKA my apartment, because New York is in lockdown. But as you can see, we are doing everything we can to still bring you space-time every week. Okay, so today we're doing comments for the last two episodes, which are on rotating black holes and quantum Darwinism. Let's see what you had to say. Eddie Mitch, always thought entanglement could only occur between two particles. Well, Eddie, what you're thinking about is the principle of monogamy of entanglement, which states that a given quantum state can only be maximally entangled with one other quantum state. Now, the key word here is maximal. As an example, the spin of a newly created electron-positron pair are perfectly correlated as being in opposite directions. Measure the spin of one and you know with perfect certainty the spin of the other. That's maximal entanglement for the spin state. If the electron then interacts with, say, a photon, so the photon and electron spin states are entangled, then that will either completely break the original entanglement or at least introduce some level of uncertainty in the correlation. So entanglement can be completely transferred or it can be shared among many particles but with reduced strength to the correlation between any two particles. St. Kirgu gives a nice analogy to describe this idea. The macroscopic world is a filter function which selects quantum states immune to entanglement diffusion. Well, that's almost it. But actually, all entanglement gets diffused during decoherence. The filter function instead causes quantum states to become correlated with macroscopic observables. The entanglement is dispersed through the environment, but in a coherent way that enables us to infer the initial quantum state. John Kramer wants to know how big an explosion you can get from a black hole bomb and kindly requests we do a whole video on the subject. Well, for the video, I'm gonna direct you to Kurzgesagt, who have a lot more details in their video and a lot more penguins. But how big is the bomb? Well, the limit is as much rotational energy as the black hole contains. And for a maximally rotating black hole, that's 40% of its total non-rotating mass, all released as energy. To put that in quantified context, think of any ridiculously energetic process. Now multiply that number by 10 to the power of some stupidly large number. Cliff86 points out that the way quantum states become increasingly entangled with their environment seems analogous to the second law of thermodynamics, aka that entropy must increase over time. Well, it's a pretty nice observation, but it's more than an analogy. Entropy and entanglement seem to be fundamentally connected. Now, over me to get around to a whole episode on quantum entropy, aka von Neumann entropy, and how it relates to classical entropy, we'll get there. Yuval Nehemia points out that Wojciech Zurek looks like the physicist version of Bob Ross. That's actually the first thing I thought. Happy little entanglements. Stay safe, everybody.